Let me um, begin at the beginning. <clears throat> this exercise was conceived a couple of years ago. Um, those of you who don't like the report can blame me for it. It was my idea. Uh, these are innocent bystanders uh, who've been uh, conscripted into the enterprise at various stages. If you do like the report, then thank Lindsay because uh, she has been the, um, the guiding hand and the drafting uh, expertise behind what you have before you. But uh, the reason for putting this together <clears throat> has, has essentially been one which says there's something adrift in the region's uh, underlying security architecture which should give us pause for thought. And in giving us pause for thought, also pause for reflection on what can be done to enhance the region's security architecture with one objective, and it's not intellectual elegance, it's not aesthetic design, it's really a question of how, as Wendy said before, a regional institution <clears throat> in security policy can help over time to bring the temperature of the region down. It can't solve, questions of architecture can never solve uh, existing security policy problems. They can help solve them, <clears throat> but they can also, most critically on the way through, assist in bringing the temperature down. When we look at the overall <clears throat> security dynamics of the Asia-Pacific region at present, we look and we observe the order which has existed by and large since 1945. The United States triumphed over Japan in Asia, building then a series of bilateral security alliances across the region uh, and other arrangements with non-treaty partners, which have established a network of um, US uh, uh, security partners across the wider Asia-Pacific region. Uh, by and large, uh, that order uh, sustained itself uh, through until the end of the Cold War. In fact, China, post-Nixon, post-Kissinger, became a de facto part of that order because of its uh, implicit cooperation with the United States in an overall policy of global containment against the then Soviet Union. In the period post-91, we've seen fundamental changes. Of course, the Soviet Union is no more. The Cold War, at least in terms of the nature of the threat as it then existed, uh, no longer exists. What we have in its place in terms of current relations between Russia and the United States is the subject for a separate discussion. But also in the period since 91, also we've begun to see uh, the emergence of different dynamics within the region. Uh, if I was to identify the single most significant event uh, geopolitically, geoeconomically, and geostrategically since the end of the Cold War, it's been the rise of China. Uh, often in excess of anyone's expectations or anticipation. And certainly in the period of the last uh, half decade or so, uh, the nature of China's presence within the wider region has been felt more strongly than ever before. To the point that we now begin to see a much more um, fractious relationship between the US and China across uh, the wider Asia Pacific region. We've seen evidence of that, of course, in tensions in the East China Sea in recent years, uh, America's ally, Japan, uh, in open confrontation with China over territorial issues in Sankoku Diaoyudao. Uh, we have seen, of course, a parallel set of events, um, but of a more diffuse nature in the South China Sea. Uh, we've seen also um, the ebb and flow of relations uh, across the Taiwan Straits. And of course, we cannot let uh, a quick tour d'horizon of East Asia and the West Pacific go by without referring to events on the Korean Peninsula, full of its own intrinsic complexities but also bringing into sharp relief the nature of the strategic and security policy relationship between China and the United States, where those interests are in common and where they are separate and perhaps in conflict. Of course, there's a danger in any of these analyses simply to stop uh, the, uh, the tour d'horizon 
um, once we hit Southeast Asia. But if we head to South Asia um, and the state of relations which uh, exists between India and China, recent disturbances on the border, bringing again into question the future of overall stability in the region long term. So the question this presents us with is given uh, the nature of the post-45 order, given the changes which have unfolded since 91, which have been in part uh, reflected in the emergence of Chinese power in the region, economic, political and foreign policy, but other factors as well, the question arises as to whether uh, we in fact need to think through clearly uh, the adequacy of our existing regional institutions to deal with those challenges. The alternative is simply to uh, accept that the current set of arrangements is fine and dandy uh, and there are no problems to deal with. That's never been my view. My view over the last decade is that we should always be in the business of building institutions regionally and globally, which over time create commonly accepted norms, practices, habits and procedures for the prevention of crises, the management of crises, and where possible, the resolution of crises as they emerge, be it on smaller questions or larger questions. Our friends in ASEAN have a good history on this internally. When I look at ASEAN as an institution over half a century, it's been a remarkable evolution and a positive evolution. Uh, historically, non-communist Southeast Asia uh, was uh, arrayed against uh, communist Vietnam uh, and, of course, uh, communist Indochina as it evolved. When I look at ASEAN 50 years from its inception in 1967, and now we have 10 member states uh, comprised of former adversaries not just within Southeast Asia in terms of the historical frictions between Singapore, Indonesia and Malaysia, but between former communist uh, and currently communist uh, Indochina uh, and the countries of Southeast Asia. And of course, since then, with the addition of Myanmar. When I look, therefore, at what ASEAN has achieved in being a direct institutional norm-setting mechanism for dealing with what appeared at the time to be long-standing, entrenched, territorial, ideological and political disputes, I think the founders of ASEAN in 67 would be surprised beyond belief at the shape of Southeast Asia today, despite our criticisms of where ASEAN now stands in dealing with some of the emerging pressures uh, across Southeast Asia. So why do I mention ASEAN in the con context of preserving the long-term peace in Asia more broadly? I think ASEAN stands out as an extraordinarily successful regional example of how an institution uh, over time can in fact take the temperature down, can over time in fact cause a region to begin focusing on other things which bring the region together like economic cooperation and like uh, conventions and forms of dispute resolution, which otherwise would not have ended up in the same direction. In the absence of ASEAN, we should ask ourselves, what would Southeast Asia look like today? And I think that is a great counterfactual question for us to reflect on. So when I look at broader East Asia and the Asia Pacific region, the question which has always presented itself to me is, Given the existence of alliance structures and given the fact that those alliance structures are not going to disappear, not least because the members of those alliance structures want them to continue, the practical question is how can uh, regional mechanisms, institutions and architecture assist in keeping the temperature down and over time building common norms, habits and cultures of problem solving in the security policy domain. My final point is this. If you reflect across uh, the Asia Pacific region, um, uh, there is one diagram in here which I would ask you to commit to memory and there'll be a test on it when you leave here today. It's this one. I would draw your attention to page 21 of the report. It is the single successful attempt on a single page to reflect all the 
institutions of the wider Asia-Pacific region and their overlapping or discontinuous memberships. Um, it's quite a valuable tool in its own right. For those of you who come from foreign embassies, I suggest this be set as the entrance exam uh, for anyone mm, seeking mm, to mm, enter mm, the mm, diplomatic mm. academies of your various countries. I think most kids would fail it. I know, I certainly would, and I've worked in this area for quite some time. But my point is this, it is not as if our region is institution poor. In fact, it's institution rich. But the core question is this, there is only one of these institutions which has an explicit mandate to deal on a pan-regional basis, a wider regional basis, with a mandate to look at and deal with questions of common security across the Asia-Pacific region. And that is something called the East Asia Summit. So what this report recommends is that we take the East Asia Summit, which has now existed for 10 years. It has a founding document called the Kuala Lumpur Declaration. It's anchored in the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which uh, all ASEAN member states have signed in the direction of, um, of peaceful dispute resolution and, pe and peaceful resolution uh, of, uh, of uh, outstanding conflicts and take the East Asian Summit to what I would call as uh, EAS 2.0, one which actually has an evolving and expanding mandate in political security questions. Firstly, to begin establishing practical working groups to deal with extant security problems. Secondly, to look at how we could develop further existing norms for dispute resolution, which are currently applicable within ASEAN, to beyond ASEAN as well. And thirdly, do we need to enhance the secretariat functions which support the East Asian Summit to give it a stronger institutional mandate for the future? Will an expanded East Asian Summit and its long-term evolution into what I have long called an Asia-Pacific community solve uh, the region's current security crises, disputes and conflicts? No. It won't solve uh, the Korean crisis. It won't solve the East China Sea. It won't solve the South China Sea. But I do hazard this opinion that it can help in preventing any of each of those crises evolving into a pan-regional conflict or war if we are serious about building institutions for the wider region. So there's the pitch, there's the argument, and we brought together in putting this report together a very impressive panel of people. Shiv Shankar Menon, former National Security Advisor of India, he was joined by Tom Donnellan, former National Security Advisor of the United States under the Obama administration. Uh, also joined by Marty Natalagawa, the former uh, Foreign Minister of uh, Indonesia. Uh, joined again by um, Madame Kawaguchi, the former Foreign Minister of Japan under the LDP government of Fukuda-san. And also uh, someone who works closely with the current LDP administration of Japan. Uh, former Russian Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov. Uh, together with uh, King Yong Sam, uh, the Korea. Uh, former foreign minister of Korea. Uh, and yours truly, my job was to provide the beer and the wine. <laughs> the others did the serious thinking and, and Lindsay here did the writing. But to achieve consensus among a group like that, frankly, is no easy thing, given that these are all relatively recent practitioners and deeply connected with their respective foreign and security policy establishments, all of which also represent EAS member states. And I'm so delighted today that Ambassador Vin has joined us to provide his commentary, given the centrality of Vietnam to the region's past and future. Enough from me by way of introductory remarks. If I could turn to um, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, my good friend, for his views on the report, then Ambassador Vin's, and then we'll open it to a general dialogue where I'll ask a few questions of our panelists and then open it to questions from the audience. Over to you, Shiv Shankar Menon. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much for that and, and for covering the report so, so well, actually, in such a short period. Uh, let me maybe look at why are we worried? I mean, why, why do we think it's necessary to start changing what we're doing? Why are we looking at the institutional architecture for Asia-Pacific security at this time. Kevin mentioned that things have changed, that the situation in the region has changed. 
And it's worth looking at the nature of that change in a little more detail, because clearly the outstanding event is, is the rise of China, but it's not just China rising. This is a crowded region. Vietnam is rising, South Korea, uh, Indonesia, India. I mean, there are several countries who have changed. And if you look at the relative balance of power in the region, it's shifted drastically. And this has an immediate consequence, I mean, because it's going to keep shifting. It's not as though we've now arrived at some new balance which is stable, a new equilibrium. Uh, so the, the immediate conclusion is that our problem is how to manage change. It's not to preserve stability, because stability is no longer sufficient. Stability to rising power sounds like stay where you are, know your place. Whereas managing change is different. It can accommodate people's aspirations and their hopes for the future, and the fact that that balance of power is still shifting. The other problem is that the balance is shifting at different rates, whether you look at security, where the U.S. is militarily preponderant and looks like staying so for the conceivable future, at the economy where, frankly, it's already a multipolar globe, whether we like it or not, and where the balance has actually shifted much faster. And in politics, nobody really knows. But what we can see, and what I think is evident to all of us, is that the old security architecture, which we inherited from after the Second World War, is no longer sufficient to deal with the issues like North Korea nuclear, South China Sea, East China Sea, nor, frankly, because this is a crowded, and not just geographically crowded, but in terms of rising powers, very crowded region, nor is a potential G2 the answer to this. Because we've seen in the case of North Korea nuclear where that can lead. So what we do need to look at is other alternatives. And this is why my own personal feeling is that, <coughs> that Asia really is at a point where we need to choose between to futures. For me, uh, a security architecture based on a single power is no longer feasible. But that requires a huge act of will on the part of the two largest powers whose relationship is getting increasingly com complicated on the part of the US and China. But there are alternative futures of a multipolar Asia with an architecture which actually accommodates all these powers and their aspirations. And for me, that's the way to go. But you can't achieve that unless you have institutions which not just enable, but actually encourage us to, to follow our better selves and our better instincts and create norms and practices. And unless you have an architecture which is open, inclusive. And what is proposed in this uh, report is something like that. The degree of formality of the architecture can vary depending on the issue, depending on the appetite the states have for it. And I say states because we're fortunate in the Asia Pacific. Our security issues are primarily between Westphalian states. Uh, some of them very bureaucratized. And in a sense, that's an advantage because you know what you're dealing with. Unlike, say, the Middle East or other parts of the world where the actors are not all states. Uh, so what should we be doing in order to move towards a multipolar architecture which can accommodate these rising aspirations and the growing sense of insecurity? Because if you look at what's happened in the last 20 years, you've really seen an increasing arms race throughout the region. And this, which reflects, I think, a sense of insecurity about what the states see around them. For me, there are new issues like maritime security, which today, this is the region which has the world's greatest trading powers. And maritime security is something that all of them have an interest in. And it's a positive sum issue because we all have an interest in freedom of navigation. It's the kind of issue we can work on. Cybersecurity, something that didn't exist earlier, which we really need to be looking at. And military doctrines and postures. I mentioned what has been happening in terms of buildups over the last few years. It's time we actually sat down and talked about it. And for me, the most 
the easiest way to enter into this is really by starting to discuss crisis management and confidence building measures in a practical way among the states. And let those who have an appetite for this actually participate in it, to the extent that they're willing to. The architecture that the report suggests, which is primarily centered on, primarily under EAS, but which builds on ASEAN centrality, for me is really the best way forward. I think that gives us enough flexibility in dealing with the issues that we have. Uh, is this going to be easy? Will it happen? Uh, it's very hard to tell. But frankly, after having gone through these two years under Kevin's chairmanship and talking to the other commissioners, where we didn't all come with the same ideas. In fact, we had very different approaches. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure where we'd end up at the end. But the fact that we came out with one report on which we agree and where we were able to reconcile differences, to find ways of dealing with them, I think that makes me an optimist. And so thank you, Kevin. Let me place on record my gratitude for the opportunity of, of serving on this commission and for, for the work that we did. I, I commend it to all of you, and please do read it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Shankar, and thank you for the kind remarks uh, at the end. Shankar's interestingly put uh, a second set of arguments in support of um, this approach. What I spoke about was, as it were, the binary between the United States and China, which is affecting so much in the wider region. And how do we use a regional institution to develop and strengthen norms for peaceful dispute resolution into the long-term future. What Shankar has pointed to is the fact that the region is much wider than a US-China binary. There is a, frankly, a rise of uh, many, many countries, many, many economies, and frankly, uh, the rise of many, many militaries. You probably know that as of uh, last year, the combined countries of Asia for the first time in history spent more on their collective uh, military outlays than did Europe. Uh, and so that trend will continue into the future as well. So for, let's call it, a whole range of other regional and sub-regional reasons, the need for a pan-regional uh, institution capable of deliberating on security uh, is in fact uh, to the collective good as well. Ambassador Vin, you're a student of um, the region's uh, uh, institutional architecture. You've been engaged in these debates over a long period of time. You're a highly experienced Vietnamese diplomat. That's why you're here in Washington. Uh, your views, please. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, speaking uh, now is very easy for me after uh, the uh, over, overviews by President uh, Kenvin Rudd and also comments by Ambassador Menon. I thank you for that. You have been talking not only about the region, but about ASEAN as well. And for me, I, I will be focusing on two points. First, I do agree with the report that uh, we need a regional architecture, and it is uh, critical at this point in time for us to talk about this issue. And the uh, political and security and economic changes in the region so fast, including also the power shifts in the region. And uh, we need to look into also the historical background of regional architecture that has built uh, throughout the years as a building blocks for Asia because Asia is so diverse and uh, emerging as one of the most dynamic regions in the world with all the major powers that have been here. And uh, the lack of one overall regional architecture also show us that we, how we need to do later on because of the years in the past that we cannot agree on one uh, that is imposed upon the region, so, which is so diverse. But we should take an approach of how to engage all the players the key players, the major powers, the small and medium-sized uh, countries in the region, and how even with the rising uh, or the current uh, most important two major powers, China and the US, how to engage 
uh, these two countries together with others in the building of the regional architecture will be an issue for us to think later on how best way that we can engage both of them in the regional processes and without uh, uh, the risk of uh, enhancing tensions or, but also enhancing the sense of accommodation and reaching a consensus on this one. So I, I come to the question of why ASEAN. I do agree with the report that the central role of ASEAN is critically important in, in this uh, process of regional uh, architecture building. Uh, President Ken Wienrat has mentioned very uh, eloquently about the 50 years of ASEAN and how ASEAN has been successful as a region. I think, number one, ASEAN can strengthen itself within. We are now building a community after 50 years, and this is the time that we can look back how we can enhance further uh, the, in, both the institutional processes that we created but at the same, same time working in partnership with dialogue partners on uh, strengthening the regional norms. And these will be the two very much important elements in, in ASEAN. And throughout the years, ASEAN has been partners, uh, have been uh, building partnerships with all the major powers that are critical to preserve peace and promote prosperity in the region. ASEAN is non-confrontational, it is cooperative and accommodating. And I think even at times of tensions between the major powers, ASEAN can be a neutral uh, environment for the major powers to interact with each other and interact with ASEAN, uh, representing the small and medium size. I do agree with you that uh, over the past 50 years, ASEAN has created a web of uh, ASEAN-led institutional processes and these this is a time that we need to strengthen these uh, uh, results and progress that ASEAN has been built. Very much often over the years, uh, ASEAN has been also criticized, despite all the praises that it has received for the, uh, the lack of consensus that it can do this thing or the other. But I think, and I do agree with the comment by uh, President Ken Vinrat that uh, multilateral institutions cannot do everything, including also on the settlement of disputes, but it can help a lot in uh, slowing down the process of tension, reducing tension itself, and have parties concerned to get together and uh, working for a solution. So I do give that this report is critically timely, especially the EAS and the asean led uh, uh, meetings will be uh, next month in, in November. The president of the U.S. is going also. And we very much hope that this, but I do recognize that the recommendations in the report are uh, very much critically thought-provoking. Some may agree, some may not. But one thing I, I want to stress here is that we need to base, uh, build upon uh, the results that ASEAN and the region has achieved including in the institutional buildings and uh, regional norms and the ASEAN centrality that we can create an environment to engage all the players in the region. And uh, I think that countries in the region should look into this report critically and then on, on how to find a better way for the region and also a recommendation to the ASEAN countries as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and, uh, and thank you for uh, reflecting on uh, ASEAN's um, own uh, deliberations on the adequacy of its internal uh, institutions. Um, and as you know, this report does not challenge the question of ASEAN centrality for wider regional institutions. It's a pretty important point. Uh, those of us who are not members of ASEAN sort of have often scratched our head and said, ASEAN centrality, is that because Southeast Asia is kind of in the middle of all of this? Um, uh, what's, what's the idea here? Uh, I think the idea as I've uh, seen it over the years has been uh, partly a reflection that uh, Southeast Asia uh, does occupy a core 
strategic position uh, in terms of, let's call it the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, it's the swing region, if you like, between uh, the vast expanses of the Indian Ocean, the vast expanses of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's where, secondly, so much of the volume of uh, Asia-Pacific trade uh, finds its way from the vast markets of Northeast Asia through to the oil and gas markets of the Middle East, uh, through to the other consumer markets of Europe and beyond. But I think there's a third reason as I've reflected on it, and it's been part of your comments, Ambassador, which is uh, the evolution of, let's call it the ASEAN way, uh, which is not simply uh, putting on funny clothes uh, at every ASEAN meeting and wearing shirts. And I'm sure you've worn a few over the years, John. I've worn a few. Um, and uh, and uh, have you been wearing ASEAN shirts? That's right. And I'm sure you've worn a few. Above my pay grade. Okay. The, uh, it is actually a slow, deliberative, uh, sometimes frustrating way of building regional consensus around common challenges. But it's got a reasonable track re- record of success, and which frankly we've not seen replicated in what is an institution poor Northeast Asia, nor, shall I say, some of the tensions which exist in South Asia. But I'll let my colleague reflect on that in his own way. Uh, the ambassador concluded with a very important observation, and that is, President Trump's about to have his first experience of all this when he travels to the region next month. How he goes with the ASEAN way will be an interesting phenomenon. Um, And I'm going to throw this difficult question to you, uh, Shivshankar, and that is uh, when the president, given his views of, let's call it, security policy more broadly, uh, lands uh, into the middle of all this, um, where do you think his views on the future of American power in Asia are going to um, um, coincide with or conflict with the notion of the further building of regional institutions? Well, I can't say that I know his views. So I, I operate at a disadvantage. But in some senses, and I think I've said this to you before, because he represents a break from what the rest of us have always regarded as the Washington foreign policy consensus, he also represents an opportunity to remake the relationships. Whether he sees uh, institutions in the Asia-Pacific taking over some of the role that he doesn't want the U.S. to perform as the center of security in the region, I'm not sure. I don't know. But it's conceivable, at least intellectually and logically, it's possible. And I would hope that he would actually use the the visit and the trip to do so, to try and see how we can continue to ensure the security that that underpins the the prosperity that we've known, that that is growing, and, and the peace that we've preserved for so long. That would be my hope, but frankly, I don't know enough, either about his views or, but I think it's, I'm glad that we've got the report out now, before his visit, before the next ES summit, and when I think the most leaderships around the region, I think, are trying to think these issues through, because the fact of the Trump administration and the president's views have really thrown many things into question, Uh, not always very comfortably from the point of view of the region, but that's not bad if it at least pushes us in the right direction. If you, it's a very interesting point you make, there's a President Trump, when viewed through the lens of, um, let's call it uh, wider Asia, include Australia in that, if there is one galvanizing point across, I think, most policy elites in our parts of the world, it's uncertainty. Um, There was once certainty um, uh, until the president's election uh, about a given set of American responses to a given set of security and other policy challenges in Asia. Uh, We now have not just uh, the repudiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but a range of other open questions 
not settled questions, but open questions about where his administration wants to take American policy and power in the wider region. And then secondly, uh, related to that, you have the continuation of an effective uh, strategy uh, from China to uh, enhance and underpin its economic strength and its strategic presence in the wider region uh, to the discomfort of a number of states welcomed by others. So these factors are occurring simultaneously, which leads me to this question. If that is so, and that's an hypothesis, then the question is, um, does this create more of an appetite within regional states for developing regional institutions than would otherwise be the case? Let's leave the US view to one side because none of us can speak for this administration. None of us are Americans and none of us work there. Um, But in terms of the wider region, I mean, uh, let me put it more starkly. I get the, the impression that there is now a degree of collective anxiety across, let's call it our wider region, about the future. And it's not just because of headlines about North Korea. It's about a range <coughs> of, uh, shall I say, security challenges, whether it's what's happening in Mindanao, uh, in the Philippines. We had the Philippines foreign minister with us in New York at the Asian Society recently. Um, uh, whether it's the unresolved questions of the South China Sea, uh, the re-emergence of tensions on the, uh, in the East China Sea, um, but also unresolved questions about the future of trade arrangements in the wider region as well. In other words, do these factors of uncertainty create more of an appetite regionally to develop um, the region's intrinsic architecture, as you've just suggested? I don't know whether you've got some thoughts on that, uh, Ambassador without getting yourself into any trouble. Uh, And I wouldn't want to put any ambassador into any trouble here. So fire away and then I'll turn it back to Shankar. Thank you very much. It's not an easy answer to a very simple question that you just put. And actually there can be a number of ways that we think about how uh, we will be critically thinking for a response to that question. Point number one that I want to raise here is that the region, including ASEAN, has been working together and it has already in place the institutional processes. And I think uh, all of us have an interest in building further upon what we already have in the absence uh, uh, by the region, in the region of an overall architecture. So those will be continued. At the same time, when we have uncertainties, I think that that would be uh, two things here. Uh, if you look just at one or the other two meetings of, of ASEAN or ASEAN-led mechanisms, we see less, it seems that uh, there is a less interest in or appetite for uh, the talks on regional architecture. Uh, but at the same time, the uncertainty has pushed us in the region, including ASEAN countries, to think how we will best serve our interests of preserving peace, security, and nurture prosperity in the region. Then countries seems to, uh, to think both ways, but I still see uh, the ongoing processes on how uh, we work together in building the regional architecture. And I think this year is t- critically important. Number one, certainly about the uncertainties that we face in the future. But point number two, it's a year of reflection of 50 years of ASEAN. And point number three, ASEAN is not wait and see for the, uh, for the major powers to interact with it. This is a time that ASEAN, as we have much, uh, very much often say that we need all the major powers throughout the, our partnerships with uh, the US, Japan, China, India, and all others, Australia, certainly. So we have to be proactive uh, in ASEAN to engage the U.S. with the new administration and other countries. So, uh, but at the same time, we see institutional buildings in in Asia as an evolving process rather than just one stop. So it will continue, it can have ups and downs, but this is a time, I think, uh, the, the region has to, to be more 
especially ASEAN, to be more proactively engaged the major powers, including the U.S. And point number two, think of uh, strengthening the institutions and the norms in the region as well. Thank you. I think uh, I'll flicker back to um, Shankar in one second. As, if I've reflected on things as this debate has evolved over many years now, um, when I was in office and kicking these debates off about the future of the region's architecture, uh, the response from many in, in the neighbourhood and among the ASEANs was, nah, not now, thank you. Um, we've got ASEAN under control. We believe in ASEAN centrality. And the unstated position, I think, from a number of the ASEANs was, uh, we don't want to create anything which dilutes the pan-regional significance of ASEAN, if I can paraphrase the position in an inelegantly direct Australian way. Um, uh, so, uh, so Kevin, go away was kind of the view back then. And then secondly, um, the response uh, came that, okay, there are some rising tensions um, going back to the events of, say, 2010 in Southeast Asia, um, famous meetings in Hanoi uh, and elsewhere, where people began to say, oh, there are some changes occurring uh, and we need to think about how these are dealt with. And then I think there were two sets of responses. Uh, one was the American pivot uh, under the Obama administration, which was supposed to have both a security and a, uh, an economic arm. Uh, the security arm was an enhancement of uh, US military uh, alliances uh, in the region and other security arrangements, plus the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and then within the region itself, there was a much wider conversation about the importance of variable geometry, almost analogous to the discussion in Europe, uh, which is, yeah, we've got APEC over here, we've got uh, the ARF over here, the ASEAN Regional Forum, um, we've got uh, the East Asian Summit here, uh, we've got the ASEAN Defence Ministers Plus 8 over here, and uh, we've got... Um, the Department of Folding Chairs and Artichoke Management down here, or whatever it's called. Um, other words, we just have all these different forums which do different things, and we will pick and choose. That, I think, is kind of the response over the last several years. But then, as things have become even sharper in the last few years, I sense that there is now a more general appetite in the region to think what next in terms of consolidated architecture. It's nice having variable geometry, um, but where do we go in order to safeguard uh, long-term security in the region, apart from or in addition to traditional security guarantees? So that's kind of my attempted periodization of the last decade or so. How crude or elegant is my periodization, Shankar. Shoot it down in flames, if you will. I, I actually agree with you. Oh, good. Terrible, isn't it? No, it's because I think with the financial crisis 2008 and the sharpening of sort of China-US strategic contention, the initial reaction of most other states was to balance and hedge and whatever, and, and all at the same time, because nobody wanted to have to choose between China and the U.S., and nobody wanted to see this get out of hand. But I think what's happened over the last few years has convinced most states that that's not sufficient, uh, that that's not a sufficient response. If anything, the situation has become more uncertain, more unstable. And to that extent, the... The coming of the Trump administration has helped to concentrate minds and actually got people looking at these issues. And I think they realize that purely bilateral or internal balancing efforts, strengthening themselves, is not enough to deal with these issues. And, and we see it every day, as you said in the headlines, North Korea nuclear, South China Sea, and so on. Uh, and that we need something more than just reliance on uh, traditional security guarantees. or So I think the time is right for this. And I think we've, we've hit on the right timing. 
But whether it's going to be exactly <coughs> what we say, no, I'd, I'd be amazed if it were. And I would say it should be, but it's most unlikely. I think what's going to happen, as usual... You mean this won't have biblical authority? Unfortunately mm. not. The, I think what's going to happen is states will pick and choose the bits that actually work for them at that moment. Now, I think we've drafted it, and this I must thank Lindsay for giving us voice. We've drafted it in a way that actually it's, it's, it gives states a range of ways of getting to the right goal. And I think that's the strength of the report. But I do think by pointing to the importance of institutions that how institutions can actually act as a safety net, as it were, in today's situation, I think it will be attractive to more countries than it might have been, say, if we'd written this three years ago or five years ago. Yeah, I th that's my sense of it in terms of regional, uh, regional appetite. Uh, Ambassador, there are some recommendations here about enhancing the EAS Secretariat in Jakarta. Um, it's a very difficult question for you. You represent a sovereign government. And I know the debates about secretariats, and I've been to the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta, and I've, I've visited the APEC Secretariat, wherever that is. Um, I've forgotten where the APEC Secretariat is. Where? Huh? Singapore? Singapore? Yeah, there you go. Got it wrong. The, uh, let's see, we, there will be a test on this uh, chart at the end of it to make sure everyone's got the answers right. On the question of secretariats, give me a little inside um, view uh, within ASEAN about uh, the virtue and the vices of a uh, secretariat. Uh, actually, uh, we think of ASEAN centrality is not taken for granted. Uh, ASEAN has to do much, but at the same time, ASEAN needs to be supported and recognized by the major powers and the partners. And uh, so our centrality in uh, creating a web of institutional processes, including the East Asia Summit, uh, has a reason for that. Uh, it's a reason that we from smaller uh, countries getting together can provide a neutral place for uh, engaging uh, dialogue partners and uh, with us and among themselves. So this continues to be an appetite for the major powers and for the region. And I think that could be uh, continued in the next years. So talking a separate secretariat for APEC, certainly you will uh, look into the eyes of uh, the ASEAN representatives. They even got my surprise also. So my, during uh, my years in Working with ASEAN, I recognize Ambassador of Myanmar here. He used to be the most recent chair in 2014. Uh, it, it's a summit uh, and other processes that ASEAN have created. We need the ASEAN centrality, both in terms of uh, uh, leading the processes in terms of working in part, but our sun centrality that also have to be including uh, working in partnerships with partners, but also the secretariat of our sun will be serving uh, uh, the purposes uh, of secretarial work for not only our sun, but all other processes. So I, I will uh, even look into this question uh, point number one, in order to have a regional architecture or build further our regional architecture, we need to engage not only ASEAN countries, but all the major uh, partners uh, in this process. And I think, uh, number one, that we can get a consensus among our partners. That will be continue to be a central point of ASEAN in every processes. And point number two, so the ASEAN Secretariat need to be strengthened and the part and or division or whatever uh, part in the ASEAN Secretariat for serving the EAS that need to be strengthened as well. And I think that in the years to come could be a most viable way uh, that we think of strengthening the regional architecture in general and also the uh, EAS in particular. And uh, ASEAN need to look into this issue on how it meets the expectations of 
all countries in the region of strengthening uh, institutional processes for peace and prosperity in the region. And I think uh, uh, if we cannot do a good job, there will be other proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Just as I begin to turn to uh, you and the audience for questions, the um, two points which come out of the ambassador's point and uh, Shivshankar's point just before. Uh, on the secretariat question, I noted very carefully what you said, which is ASEAN cannot take for granted wider regional acceptance permanently of the notion of ASEAN centrality. Okay? It's a doctrine within ASEAN, but frankly it's a voluntary position taken by the rest of us to accept ASEAN centrality in terms of wider regional deliberations. So the logic of that is that in terms of the interests of India, Australia, sorry, and uh, Northeast Asia, um, then um, uh, these have to be reflected, in my judgment, in a more substantive and activist secretariat. Otherwise, people will go elsewhere. They'll regard ASEAN-related institutions as not effectively representing the pan-regional set of interests. Uh, so our friends in ASEAN have to balance this between their own intrinsic desire to keep ASEAN central not only to their own deliberations but to the wider regions and, frankly, opening the forum uh, to um, other voices uh, in order to uh, ensure that the rest of the region continues to use ASEAN-centred institutions to deal with pan-regional security challenges. I think that's a... I've built on your point deliberately and sharply um, because uh, that, I think, is a, a warning sign for the future. Further, if ASEAN does that, entrenches the Secretariat, which is discreetly and more substantially dealing with EAS questions and pan-regional questions, at the same time, it is actually further entrenching uh, the region's wider view of ASEAN itself, given the recent pressures which ASEAN internally has been under. And finally, as I go to the questions from the audience, is uh, Shiv Shankar's point before about uh, a greater regional appetite for dealing with or addressing the question now of um, the strengthening of regional institutions is kind of this, and you may take exception to this, uh, Shankar, but I'm going to be crude in the depiction of it. Um, one is, if you're looking at the whole security dynamics of the wider Asia and Pacific region. Um, I see it as folding in three sets of directions. You have maritime Asia anchored in uh, US alliances um, and the overwhelming presence of the US Pacific fleet based in Hawaii, organized through PACOM. That's a formidable set of arrangements. Not just alliances, but also other sub-treaty arrangements with various countries. So you have all of that. In continental Asia, uh, you have the emergence of a series of institutions which are anchored in Beijing. Uh, started with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, but also through other regional institutions such as SICA, uh, which I think you guys have recently joined. Is that correct in India? SICA, we've been from the beginning, SCO. We've oh, SCO, you've just joined. And so I'm not saying that both these institutions are inherently uh, uh, strong or, uh, shall I say, natural competitors to uh, the US maritime alliance system. But the point about both of them is that they are Beijing-centred uh, in their evolution over time. Now, that's where you may disagree with the argument. But what I see is a set of continental arrangements emerging in continental Asia, uh, anchored in Beijing, and maritime security arrangements anchored in Washington and US-based alliances. Thirdly, the third dimension I was pointing to before is, frankly, what's up the middle, which is the uh, ASEAN-related institutions or the ASEAN-centered institutions, where both China and the United States come together. Um, we have that in the ASEAN Plus arrangements. We now have it, uh, we have it in APEC arrangements. Um, and we also have it, at least in theory, with EAS arrangements. So it, it kind of highlights, I think, if I was looking at this at tectonic plates, you've got military alliances with the US pulling in that direction. You've got continental arrangements 
pulling in a, in a different direction, partly because of the different terrains they're being dealt with, it further reinforces the need for deliberative mechanisms up the middle anchored uh, in uh, the ASEANs. As I said, that's Can pretty crude. Something? Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting because continental orders by definition are zero sum. Territory can only belong to one or another. Maritime orders by definition are positive sum because trade benefits everybody, everybody has an interest in freedom of navigation, and so the order you construct is different, is very different whether it's continental or maritime. Our problem in the Asia-Pacific is we're both. Hmm. That's true. And, and the interaction of these at the choke points, for instance, is, is really quite complicated, whether it's, you know. So what you say is absolutely right. There's room, actually, for something much more imaginative and much more flexible, rather like what we've pr proposed, because of the differ differing nature of these orders. And it'll be interesting to see how we actually do this. How we, But I th as I said at the beginning, I think the key is the two preponderant powers, China and the U.S., need to be able to accept this idea that it's not just a one-power-centered order that we can construct because that's not going to solve the problem. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating set of points. But anyway, that's just a gloss on what you were saying. No, no it's, a, it's an important set of points. Now, folks, we have some time for some questions and observations uh, from the audience. And uh, I notice um, Ambassador Negroponte at the front. I'll, I'll give him um, the floor first because we've spoken boldly on behalf of the United States in this gathering, and none of us have the credentials to do so. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> We're used to it. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you. It was a really very interesting discussion. Um, I was in the political section in our embassy in Saigon in 1967 when ASEAN was announced. I was, and I remember watching... Were you uh, for all, or against, John? What? The establishment of ASEAN. Well, we didn't know. We, we just saw it happening, and we wondered what it was going to be about and noted that I think it, it emphasized at the time the sort of social aspect of the situation. And so it's been very interesting to watch it emerge. And fast forward to uh, the refugee crisis in the late 1970s and the boat people coming out of Vietnam and Cambodia and all, the, all of the refugee hmm. management issues – uh, ASEAN ended up playing a central role. And I remember when I took over as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Southeast Asia from uh, Bob Oakley, hmm. my predecessor in that job, I said, well, do you have one major piece of advice for me? And he said, well, on, on this refugee thing, follow the ASEAN lead. And it was very interesting. And, and we did center our discussions in ASEAN. So I think that was one of the things that precipitated a certain amount of organizational activity. I recognize that was before Vietnam was a member, but... Uh, I think there were only six at the time. And so now, in the last few years, I think we've seen another evolution in our approach, which is starting, I think Mr. Bush was tempted, but he didn't have time and he was too focused on other issues. But President Obama and Mrs. Clinton definitely oriented us more towards ASEAN and the EAS. We had studied the EAS in the Bush administration and our legal advisors told us, you can sign it. There's no problem. It doesn't conflict with any, any existing treaties or everything else. But we just didn't have the political will to move forward on it. The, the Obama administration did, and I think that's a very significant development. Much of it's symbolic, I know, but just the fact of coming to those meetings every year and the willingness to do that, and I think it, it could evolve into something uh, I have just one question, though, and that is, uh, where's the, it, you know, what what are the short-term deliverables? And I know, you know, Americans always looking for a deliverable from whatever it is, and and it seemed to me you haven't been to enough ASEAN summits. <laughs> well, I've been to a few, though. I've sung for my supper. At ASEAN. Um, uh, code of conduct. I mean, if talk about if there is a security issue that affects, well, many of the ASEAN members, ourselves, hmm. and China, and, you know, if we can't get something like that done, then people are going to say, well, why are you making all this effort to create this kind of institution? There's the burning issue at the moment. You mentioned it earlier. And uh, do you think that, that the 
East Asia Summit and other institutions can help us improve the chances of getting something like a code of conduct or making a, some progress on that whole uh, South China Sea issue? And I guess the East China also. But South China, it seems to me, is the more important of hmm. conflicts. Okay. I might throw out two or three sentences in response to that and invite the colleagues and then we'll go to further questions. Um, having been party to those negotiations in 2010 to get the United States in, uh, and Russia, by the way, into the East Asia Summit in 2010, and having spent a lot of time lobbying the White House at the time when I was in office, and the, and the administration, I think, was split uh, and which way to go. Um, because it's quite unusual for the United States to join an institution like that, given that you're a country which operates through alliances, uh, by and large, apart from the UN. And it wasn't invented, and it wasn't invented um, in the US of A. Definition, bad. Well, <laughs> dysfunctional. But we won't go there, okay? <laughs> but uh, the really interesting question that you pose is, what then were the deliverables? So starting at the very modest end of that spectrum, what I did with Martin at Lagawa actually at the time, uh, was that we drafted uh, the, um, uh, the EAS uh, protocol for uh, uh, common participation in disaster management for all the AS states, which actually, to my great surprise, has frankly uh, developed quite strongly. And so that now, never reaches any newspapers, the PLA, the Marines, uh, the Australian um, um, Special Forces or whatever, um, uh, are engaged in uh, counter-disaster exercises every year, um, both desktop and in the field. That's, that's some s small thing to be, um, uh, to be uh, confident about. Now, you go on to uh, what is, I think, a mo much more substantive deliverable, which is uh, South China Sea Code of Conduct. Uh, I won't go into the entrails of that other than to say that the most recent declaration coming out of the last... Um, uh, ASEAN uh, summit meeting with the Chinese was the code of conduct um, is now ambassador. What's the current status of the negotiations on the code of conduct? Uh, first on the question of uh, South China Sea and uh, the role of ASEAN and uh, other related uh, processes is also a question of managing expectations. Uh, ASEAN can help and ASEAN and China is now talking on uh, a code of conduct on, in the South China Sea. And uh, it has reached uh, what we call the COC framework agreement. And it is a framework, so it, it uh, it's, uh, stipulates our uh, number of elements that will be taken care of uh, in uh, the next step of negotiations. And uh, so we have to work further for the details of that one. We have a declaration of, uh, of conduct for the parties concerned in the South China Sea back in uh, 2002. We have to build upon that as well. So one, one thing that uh, we have been discussing, and I think we need to work uh, harder together to get that one, is that the nature of the uh, code of conduct. It is confidence building, it is managing tensions, and it is also need to be observing uh, international law, in particular uh, uh, the UNCLOS, uh, the UNCLOS 1982 uh, safeguarding freedom of navigation and overfly as well. So, when the code conduct be legally binding, it is still a question that we need further discussions. During my time in NASA and uh, until very recently, 2014, I think that there's uh, an expectation from ASEAN that we can uh, talk and turn out to have a legally binding document on that one. But uh, let's see how it works. I know that that topic will continue to be difficult. A lot of the criticism of the process uh, between ASEAN and China uh, has been uh, criticism of China. Uh, by some that uh, this is simply a diplomatic mechanism for China to continue to kick it down the road. So the question which arises, which I think is Ambassador Negroponte's point, is let's just say, hypothetically, and I'm not asking you this, mm -hmm. I'm just observing it, that if ASEAN uh, and China do not re reach a substantive agreement uh, on a code of conduct, 
does this automatically then invite itself onto an EAS agenda involving the wider set of states, uh, given that freedom of navigation is a concern not just to the 10 ASEANs and China, it's a concern to a whole bunch of countries. So I might just leave that one hanging there, if that's okay, um, John, unless you want to do add, Shankar. I, looking for deliverables, I know diplomats, we love declarations and principles and, you know, we, and it gives us lifetime employment. But <laughs> if I were looking for deliverables, I, I would look at the practical things that we do. I mean, disaster relief is one obvious one where we've done a lot already. Uh, but terrorism is back in the region all the way across. Uh, and I think we, we can do practical things in counterterrorism under EAS if, because that would bring all of us together. And there's appetite for it. It's the same thing with these humanitarian crises we've had, you know, Sulu Sea, Andaman Sea in 2015. Uh, these are issues where at the practical level, we don't have too much trouble taking care of pir piracy off the Malacca Straits, for instance. We did it from zero and we created institutions out of nowhere. But if you look at the practical record of here's a problem, how do we solve it? Let's all try and find a solution. We, we don't do badly. But uh, I wouldn't look at immediate deliverables in the larger, broader, you know, area of documents and statements. And, and in any case, for me, the real test is building the habits of cooperation and the, and the practices of, of working together, which then make it harder to actually, for crises to go wrong, horribly wrong. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah. Really and I think we can do some like that. And this is why I mentioned, you know, cyber. Uh, maritime security, terrorism, military doctrine and the postures. These are things where you can actually do stuff. And those are touched on in this uh, report as well. So it's still batik versus deliverables. So but you, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work that one through. Two questions from the audience, the lady here and the gentleman there. Yeah. There's a microphone coming to you, just behind you. Is thank it? you. My name is Jean Ningwe, and with voice of Vietnamese Americans. First, I'd like to thank ASPI uh, for the report. I think it's very good start and it's very comprehensive. I look through it and I think there's a page with all the recommendations that involve all the um, institutions from international to regional. Uh, thank you. So I have three questions and one for Ambassador New Group 20 with short-term deliverables. <laughs> the first one I would like to ask from uh, Ambassador Ving from Vietnam, because obviously Vietnam would play or could play a stronger or more central role in Asia and also international peace as well. Um, I'm asking about the TPP-11 uh, and the ASEP. There was a talks that Vietnam and Japan uh, and other Australia and other uh, 11 TPP nations uh, continue, are hoping to continue on that. Would you confirm and say where we are with that? And can we hope that that will actually materialize? Would you also tell us where Vietnam is with the ASEP? And recently I heard that in Virginia, uh, the state of Virginia has openly signed an MOU with six provinces in Vietnam to do trades. In those trades, can we expect to have the TPP standards be honored so that we later can have the U.S. involved as a whole, not just Virginia. The now, other question gonna, I have... I'm going to leave that there. No, no, I do have a no, question for Ambassador Schenker regarding the Excuse Mekong me. River. Hello, hello, hello. I'm just not going to allow it because we just, we're running short of time. I need to give other people a question. That first question we're going to get answered, and I'm going to flick over to this gentleman here. There's just too many. Is that Okay. Thank I you. do want to ask about the Mekong River. So. Okay, well, you can have a chat afterwards. I just need to give the microphone around the room. Um, okay, so. thank you. Um, my question, uh, my name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. My question is for, for you, Mr. Kevin. I know you have a very close relationship with Chinese and American leadership. So President Trump will visit China? Depends on the season, but go on. Yeah, <laughs> and... Um, Considering his agenda of American first, and also this visit just occurred right after the 19 party Congress, if you could give a recommendation for the both sides, um, 
what do you think they should talk mm -hmm. about the mutual strategic reassurance? Um, do you believe they need to sign a kind of something like uh, the force communicate or something like that? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, sir? Behind you and then you, sir. Isri Tao from the uh, Georgetown University, a student. Uh, thank you for the panelists, for the inspiring ideas. Uh, just two questions. First, uh, on drawing this report, do you uh, include somebody, you know, academics from China or practitioners from Chinese, you know, for ministry or something? Because I, I, I just want to know whether the, their voices or ideas have been included in this report. I can deal with that very quickly. Yes, Wang Ji Si, uh, Peking University, member of the uh, foreign policy board of the Chinese foreign ministry. The second, maybe my uh, observation, because we talk about dynamics in Asia, we talk about these uncertainties, uh, even the tensions are more higher than maybe five years ago. Maybe five or ten years ago, we're talking about multilateral building in Asia, including the uh, ASEAN. I think it is more proper or more hopeful. But now we see like all the uh, security tensions, especially in Northeast uh, Asia, the Korea, you know, the Korean Peninsula. My observation is that the real politic, you know, big powers playing with, you know, by bilateral way rather than on multilateral uh, channels. See, the my observation is that the Korean Peninsula put push pushes China and U.S. even closer. So my observation is that is it much more hopeful that we build on this, you know, ASEAN centrality, centric kind of uh, multilateral um, building institutions, or we return to the re real politic? Thank you. Okay, good. I'm going to, in division of labor, the first question from our friend here will be answered by uh, the Vietnamese ambassador who deals with Vietnam. The third question, which deals with real politic uh, versus multilateralism, by Shiv Shankar. Uh, I'll have a go very briefly at the question on um, President Trump. And sir, I think you had a question. Yes, I think towards the transactional relationships, uh, is there a reduced role for ASEAN? Okay. Um, I will uh, uh, have a go at that at the end, if that's okay. Let's just, I'm conscious of everyone's uh, time. So, Ambassador, if I could ask you to answer the question which specifically dealt with Vietnam, then Shankar, and then I'll round off. Uh, on the question of TPP and TPP 11, uh, the 11 uh, partners, or remaining 11 partners in, in the TPP, consider that there have been a lot of key elements that are. Uh, good for future trade in the region, and they continue to talk about this one. To be short, sure, they are aiming to keep the TPP-11 uh, alive, and at the same time, continue to open the door for future engagement of the U.S. That will be the two key elements in the discussion in TPP-11. And what will be the future of it? They are still discussing. They are planning also a, a meeting uh, during the APEC summit in Vietnam. So we have to wait and see for that one. Now, with regard to, to Vietnam, there are two points here that Vietnam continue is economic reform uh, because that has served uh, the country's interest, but at the same time provide an environment uh, good for the businesses, including uh, foreign investors. And the other one is that uh, with or without the TPP, we have uh, more than 10 other FTAs with other countries, including the high standard ones, such as the FTA with uh, the Republic of Korea and with the EU. So continue the implementation of those FTAs will uh, uh, push us for further reform as well. So I think uh, the key elements of the TPPs uh, as reflected in the TPP itself or the other uh, elements in, in the other FTAs will be part of the national package for reform. Thank you. That's good. Thank you very much. 
Shankar, could you comment on the question of um, About real politic. real politic versus, versus multilateral? Us hopeless idealists who believe in multilateral. I think we say in the report that uh, real politic is alive and well in the Asia Pacific, and I think that's part of the problem. Uh, that's where it has brought us to a situation where we feel more insecure and more uncertain than we did in the past, which is why we're looking at what we can do. But the fact is that multilateral institutions or any institutions only work to the extent that they reflect the balance of power. I mean, they can't go against it. It's not as though this is an either-or choice. We are now at a stage where the balance of power itself has got much more complicated and complex than it was before. And therefore, we need institutions to actually mitigate the effects of that. And I think that's what I was trying to, to explain. So it's not, will we stop following real politic? I think, you know, Asians have a 4,000, what, 4,000 year tradition of doing this. And I don't see us changing How did it go? overnight. Not badly, okay. not badly. <laughs> the historical norm in Asia, for me, this is important, is, is actually of a multiverse. And in a sense, I think we're reverting to that. But in order to get there, we need to actually have a conversation, and, and, and the best place to do it is through multilateral fora, rather than one state deciding for everybody else and telling everybody else. That's, that's the simple point. So this is a deep assault on Western conceptual notions of, uh, of order. Well, actually, if you look at Europe, you did best uh, not with, well, if you look at Europe, Europe did best yeah. in the concert of Europe when several powers actually worked together. And that was a long piece in Europe. Uh, so for me, this is, this is the logical choice. doesn't mean we'll take it, but, but I think we should try. What about the Franco-Prussian War and the Crimean War? There's a, that was the result of real politics, <laughs> un, unaided. But that's what I said. When the balance of power changes, yeah, yeah. no institution's going to solve this problem for you. It's, it's, a, it's a, quite a profound point. Uh, to conclude, just a, an observation about, um, I think Shankar has gone a long way to answering, in fact, your final question. So I might leave that uh, with his eloquence, if that's okay. On the question of President Trump uh, visiting um, uh, the region and uh, and visiting China, um, and uh, and that'll be post the Party Congress uh, in China. Uh, it'll be a highly significant visit uh, for all the reasons everyone anticipates in this room. I think President Xi Jinping took a calculated political risk in travelling to Mar a Lago, and by and large, it was successful. Um, the expectations were very low. Um, and what emerged were two sets of processes, one on trade, investment uh, and the economy and the other on national security questions. Those processes are still unfolding. We don't know what the destination is for each of them, despite the nature of um, presidential tweets. Um, it's still unfolding. I think um, uh, I never, I'm never in the business of providing any government with public advice. Uh, I think that's sort of profoundly unwise. Um, and it's also impertinent um, because it's, you know, the President of the United States will have his own counsel. Um, but I would say uh, to uh, both countries, I think, uh, just to reflect on the fact, um, I think there's one thing I'd, I'd ask both countries to reflect on, is that Supporting what Shiv Shankar Menon has said before and the ambassador, the US and China have massive bilateral interests at stake. We understand that. Those of us who are not Americans and not Chinese, we really get that. Um, but the rest of us have profound equities in the future of that bilateral relationship as well. This is not, we are not simply a bunch of bystanders uh, who are looking at this and saying, it's all up to you. I think what we are collectively saying across uh, Asia is how you resolve the future of your bilateral relationship and your bilateral security, shall I say, dealings on questions on the Korean Peninsula more broadly radically affect the future for all of us. Because at the end of the day, nobody in this region wants to end up with a stark binary alternative. 
uh, between one or the other. Uh, my final point is sometimes I detect both in Washington and Beijing a view at, yeah, we appreciate your views and your analyses of what's going on in China and when I go to Beijing, what's going on in Washington. But really, we've got this bilateral stuff well under control. Um, and so just butt out of there. I suppose what I'd say is, having listened to the other couple of billion people who live in Asia, uh, we actually have a slightly different view, which is how you manage this relationship and how you harness the institutions of the region, both existing and in the future, uh, affects us all um, quite profoundly and therefore our perceptions of these two great countries as well. That, I think, is what I'd say more broadly as we approach uh, the bilateral summit in Beijing. Folks, thank you so much for your patience and endurance. Um, I would uh, thank again uh, Lindsay Ford for her excellent work here uh, at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, she and Wendy, that I don't know this yet, uh, will be making the calls on um, 17 uh, EAS embassies minus Vietnam, because you're here, uh, 16 if we include the ambassador of Myanmar, uh, to um, take our report around argue its merits in the lead up to the November East Asian Summit. Um, and that's going to be important work as we seek to socialise the recommendations here into the governments of the region. Uh, and finally, if I could ask you to put your hands together for these two excellent panellists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.